Good morning. I'm going to discuss how to use antihyperglycemic therapies or drugs in treating a patient with diabetes and kidney dysfunction or chronic kidney disease. Uh, I'll start with the introduction and then the target glycemic control in these patients will be discussed and then uh, is A1C is the best to follow the glycemic state in these patients or their an alternative and then the pharmacokinetics interaction pharmacodynamic interaction of the drugs and one of the important sectors here in this presentation is how to use an diabetic drug for the sake of nephroprotection and then I'll conclude the presentation let us start with the definition of chronic kidney disease according to the Kidigo definition 2012 we can define a patient to have chronic kidney disease if he has one of the markers of kidney damage, one or more, or decrease the GFR for a period more than three months. So these changes should be persistent for more than three months. So markers of kidney damage may include persistent albuminuria, persistent hematuria, electrolyte and other abnormalities due to blood disorders, abnormalities detected by histology, by imaging, or history of kidney transplantation. Decrease the GFR less than 60 ml per minute uh, to define CKD. So, based on estimated GFR, and according to the KDGO, the best formula to be used is CKD epidemiology equation. We make it further divide chronic kidney disease or categorize chronic kidney disease state into five stages. Grade one, normal or high GFR above 90 ml per minute, provided that there is a marker of kidney damage, persistent albuminuria or hematuria or other variables, as I mentioned in the, in the previous slide, for more than three months. Stage two, estimated GFR between 89 to 60 ml per minute. Stage three, from 59 to 30, and this stage is subdivided into 3A. If estimated GFR between is between 59 to 45, 3B between 44 and 30, and stage 4, if estimated GFR less than 30 and above 15, and stage 5, if estimated GFR is below 15 milli per minute. And then we can follow the uh, the codes of the color if you find the green color here this corner with A1 albuminuria in this range with estimate GFR above 60 this this patient if the patient lies in this corner this means that there is no chronic kidney disease and according to the color codes yellow orange and red the risk increases toward the higher incidence of indecision kidney disease progression of CKD, mortality, and development of acute kidney injury. All these variables, uh, outcome variables, can increase if the color code increases. So we should be careful about the definition of chronic kidney disease. The cost of treatment of diabetes and the chronic kidney disease is increasing through years. If you look at the United States system, the management of diabetes at large uh, you can find here on 1993 was 20 uh, billion dollar and increased up to more than 80 billion dollar you know, on 2013. So there is a lot of money uh, paid for the management of diabetes in general. If chronic kidney disease is added to diabetes, a lot of comorbidities occur. So the uh, presence of chronic kidney disease in a diabetic patient is bad news. As you see in this figure, uh, uh, you can find a single patient with multiple comorbidities, and the comorbidities are if kidney dysfunction is added to diabetes, hypertension increases up to 98% of the patients will be the, uh, hypertensive, anemia in two thirds of cases, dyslipidemia in 60%, tertinopathy in one third. And you can look at all comorbidities in the slide, so the presence of kidney dysfunction is bad news in diabetic. And this is one of the most recent publications in black, 
showing that the presence of a cocktail of diabetes mellitus plus coronary kidney disease is associated with significant increased incident stroke, increased incident uh, coronary heart disease and cardiovascular death in comparison to the different cocktail, uh, either absence of diabetes or absence of CKD. What about our target in managing these patients? According to the standards of medical care uh, this year, uh, we should seek to opt uh, optimizing glucose control to reduce the risk or slow the progression of diabetic kidney disease. Let me to start with these two questions from the clinical practice guideline that was published in May 2015. Should we aim to lower hemoglobin A1C by tighter glycemic control in patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease stage 3b or higher this means 3b 4 or 5 is an aggressive treatment strategy from the management drugs oral or injections or even follow up is severe to a more relaxed way of management uh, let us to look at the statement of the guidelines here the, the, the guidelines recommended against a tighter glycemic control if this results in severe hypoglycemic episodes. And this is recommendation, a recommendation based on moderate evidence of research. And so as a nephrologist, we should know the hypoglycemic risk and we should be professional in risk stratification of the patients according to the hypoglycemic risk. So we have low risk, green color, moderate risk, yellow color, and high risk, uh, red color. So metformin, use of metformin, or alpha glucosidase inhibitor, or DBB4 inhibitors, in creatine mimetics, TZDs, sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, all these drugs are associated with low risk of hypoglycemia. This is a very important statement that we will refer at the end of the presentation. There's advantage for these drugs if, if they are feasible to be used. And then the moderate risk of hypoglycemia for short acting sulfonylurea derivatives or sulfonylurea derivatives with inactive metabolites and meglitinides. All these have moderate risk. Here, Drug-drug interaction, hepatic failure, CKD stage 5, estimated GFR below 15 mL per minute, or the presence of gastroparesis, the use of insulin, long acting sulfonylurea derivatives with active metabolites, all these states and situations and drugs are associated with high risk of hypoglycemia. So, the guideline recommended intense self-monitoring only to avoid so here, the, the intense in monitoring to avoid hypoglycemia in patients at higher risk, I had at high risk of hypoglycemia. So this is one of the most important goals and target in glycemic control is to avoid the occurrence of hypoglycemia because the occurrence of uh, hypoglycemia is associated with uh, more complications, and they recommended vigilant attempts to tighten glycemic control with the intention to lower hemoglobin O1C when values are above 8.5%. And this is recommendation based on weak evidence of research. Again, the presence of chronic kidney disease with diabetes are associated with different degrees of low plasma glucose reading. And you can find here the incidence rates for hypoglycemia uh, reaching uh, below 50 milligram per deciliter plasma glucose is, a, is linked to coronary kidney disease. So the lesson is we should individualize the diabetic management according to patient characteristics. So we should individualize treatment. For example, if the risk, risks potentially associated with hypoglycemia and other adverse effects are high, this means this is a call for less stringent treatment and A1C to be above 7% even up to 8% if the patient witnesses uh, a lot of hypoglycemia. 
But if there is no hypoglycemia or no risk of hypoglycemia, we should be strict in the management. If the disease duration is long standing, we, it is better to be relaxed. If the life expectancy of the patient is short, it is better to be relaxed in management and just to treat to avoid the diabetes, severe hyperglycemia. Because hypoglycemia will be fatal in this situation. So the guidelines, Kiduki and the Kidigo, we have two ways. Either to target A1C below 7%, this is standard for optimal glycemic control and the prevention of nephropathy if it if it is feasible and if there is no risk of hypoglycemia but if the if we have advanced chronic kidney disease with a history of hypoglycemia so we can opt to use a1c above seven percent especially for elderly and individuals more prone to hypoglycemia let us to look at this study this extension to a court study, they looked at the, uh, the, uh, the presence of chronic kidney disease in the baseline of these patients, and then they further categorize the patients to intensive glucose control or more relaxed control. If you look at the all primary outcome and secondary outcome points, you will find patients with CKD are associated with uh, less favorable outcome and there is no evidence that the intensive treatment of diabetes in a patient with chronic kidney disease is associated with better outcome as shown in this extension of the study. From advance on, what is the lesson? The lesson is after follow-up for nine, for nine years of survivor of, uh, survivors of advance on trial, here if you look, if you intense intensive in your treatment for diabetic state and the patient in CKD stage 1 and 2, this is advantages and the um, here the number need to treat to prevent occurrence of end stage kidney disease is 109 patients. But with advanced above stage 3, the number need to treat increased to 393 patients which is not uh, of cost of benefit. It's more costly. So the lesson from the advance on is if you want to intensify the treatment of diabetes it starts early on in the early nephropathy but with advanced stage there is no uh, convincing evidence of superiority of intensive management regarding hemoglobin a1c uh, why this question to select a1c or alternative test this is because a1c is associated well causes that leads to causes that lead to false high levels of a1c and false low uh, you can read the advantages and the advantage the advantages of a1c from this table so advantages uh, marker of longer term uh, glycemic control excellent standardization available everywhere and the disadvantage false increased values with iron deficiency with renal failure state even with the acidosis, all these can lead to false high. Treatment of anemia with iron or erythropoiesis stimulating agents will lead to false low because it increases the generation of young cells. Let us to look at the uh, portf portfolio of the other tests, like glycated albumin. We have advantages and disadvantages. Again, uh, glycated albumin should be done every two three weeks so it, it's a very it's expensive not available in all labs and these advantages there are situations and drugs that leads to false values again this is not the standard test fructosamine again you can find advantages and disadvantage and other tests and even the uh, continuous glucose measurement uh, so after this discussion, to use hemoglobin A1C or not, from the re recommendations of the guidelines, they recommended to use hemoglobin A1C as a routine reference to assess longer-term glycemic control in patients with CKD, C3B, or higher. And this is a recommendation based on uh, weak evidence. And if you, 
it is better to supplement hemoglobin A1C by frequent monitoring of the glycemic state plasma glucose if the patient witnesses or has uh, uh, glyce hypoglycemic episodes. The coming sector of the, of the presentation, I'll give ideas about the drug use from the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamic interaction. Pharmacodynamic means um, either the drug effect or side effects. Pharmacokinetics discusses the dose, the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. So, this is a very important question. Is there, is any oral drug superior to another in terms of mortality, complication, glycemic control in patients with diabetes and CKD? In patients with diabetes type 2 and CKD 63B or higher, is maximal oral therapy better than starting or adding insulin at an earlier stage? I'll try to uh, give you uh, uh, ideas about the drugs so start with the mechanism of action. We have bigonides. It decre bigonides decrease hepatic glucose production, increase insulin sensitivity, increase insulin mediated utilization of glucose in peripheral tissues, uh, decrease glucose in cell absorption. So the typical model of this class is metformin. Sulfonylurea stimulate insulin secretion from the pancreas close potassium ATP channels on beta cell plasma membrane and you can look at these uh, colobromide, glibinoclamide, glibazide, glibaride, glibaride, glibazide, glycodone all these are examples of this class Meglitonides stimulate pancreatic insulin secretion by closing potassium ATPs so this is another secretagogue for insulin Natiglonide and riboglonides are examples. Alpha glucosidase inhibitor, uh, inhibitors block the action of alpha glucosidase with reduced the hydrolysis of complex starch. Acarbose and miglitol are examples. Glitazones reduce insulin resistance, increase glucose uptake in muscle and adipose tissue, decrease hepatic glucose production, and the example is bioglitazone. DBB4 inhibitors inhibit DBB4, which inactivate endogenous in creatine, like alogleptin, linagleptin, saxagleptin, cetagleptin, and vildagleptin. In creatine mimetics, promote glucose dependent insulin secretion by pancreatic beta cells, suppress glucagon secretion, slow gastric emptying, like xenotide, liragl liraglutide, or lixenotide. The amylene analogs, like uh, bram, uh, bramlimitide and this, regu uh, regu this drugs regulate glucose level in response to food intake, control gastric emptying. Sodium glucose transporter, co-transporter to inhibitors block the sodium glucose transport to protein subtype 2, thus increase real loss of glucose and the examples canagliflozine, dapagliflozine, uh, and imba glyphosine. This cartoon shows the drug classes and the site of action. You can look at the different drugs and the site of action as I mentioned in, uh, in the previous slide. Again, for the sodium glucose uh, absorption, this is in the proximal converted tubulin, this, uh, the glucose is filtered, sorry, in the glomerulus glucose is filtered and then reabsorbed by proximal converted tubule. We have two co-transporters, sodium glucose co-transporter 2 is abundant 90% in segment 1 of the proximal converted tubule and 10% of the transporter lies in S3 segment of proximal converted tubule and they are responsible about glucose reabsorption. So sodium glucose co-transporter 2 uh, uh, co-transporter 2 is responsible about the absorption of glucose and if the uh, plasma glucose is one with the normal uh, values you will find no glucose in urine and sodium when we use sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor this will reduce the action of sodium glucose co-transporter 2 and this will lead to uh, glucosuria up to 70 to 80 gram per day. One of the important points to be clarified is 
in type 2 diabetes the absorption of glucose is increased elevated by the proximal convertible why because the environment increase the expression of sodium glucose co-transporter 2 this leads to increasing the threshold of absorption and shifting from this value to higher value at the end of the day the glucose increases in blood and lead to also glucosuria so uh, and this is why the rationale of the use of so sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor it uh, decreases the threshold of absorption toward to, toward the normal and the getting rid of glucose uh, through the kidney decreasing absorption so it leads to glucosuria this will decrease inflammation inflammatory response let us go to the drugs pharmacokinetics metformin you are seeing prescribing information the metformin is contraindicated if the creatinine is above 1.5 in men or 1.4 in women UK guidelines allow metformin in patient with estimated GFR above 30. KDUG recommend metformin in patients with estimated GFR above 45 and to be avoided below 30 ml per minute. Again, if it is feasible to give this drug, it was very cheap, it's better to start with metformin. But be careful in cases with unstable GFR to avoid its acc accumulation that may lead to uh, acute problems like ketoacidosis. Sulfonylurea, glipizide can be given with no dose adjustment required. Glipizide in sheet conservatively at one milligram daily. Avoid its use if estimated GFR is less than 60 milli per minute per 1.73 square meter. Glipizide, reduce the dose if estimated GFR is less than 30 milli per minute, not recommended if estimated GFR is less than 15 milli per minute. Galiboride, avoid use in patients with documented CKD, especially if estimated GFR is less than 60 milli per minute. Ribaglanide, initial dose is 0.5 milligram before meals when estimated GFR is less than, is less than 30 milli per minute. Nitroglyceride caution when using with estimated GFR less than 30 initiate with 60 mg before meals. Alpha glucosidase inhibitors to be avoided if estimated GFR is less than 30 mL per minute. TZDs, although they need no dose adjustment, but use them with great caution because of so, uh, volume overload and hypervolemia. So it's better to be avoided in well-established coronary kidney disease. This table shows the dosage and the, the modified dose, bioavailability, half-life, and time to peak of action for the different available drugs uh, in the United States and Europe from the class of sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor, CANA, uh, DAPA, and IMPA, gliflozine. Here you can find a very simple and, uh, and smart way of uh, knowing the drug. So all these are the antidiabetic drugs by names and the classes of urea, metformin, sulfonylurea, meglitonide, alpha glucosidase inhibitor, DBB4 inhibitors, incretin myometics, uh, amylene, and the sodium glucose co-transporter co 2 inhibitors. And we will find the different here, the different degrees of chronic kidney disease. Green color means no modification. Yellow color means that drug needs modification and red color to be avoided. You can follow, for example, in DBB4 inhibitor, you will find linagliptin is the only drug that needs no modification. For other drugs, they need, they need modification if, with the advancement of uh, uh, CKD. Here I want to just to give a comment. Is modification of the drug by giving lower dose is advantage or disadvantage some authors find that the drugs that need need no modification this this is a good option and others find that when you use any drug that needs modification 
to lower the dosages with the different degrees of CKD, it will be uh, cheaper and of cost to benefit. Again, we should look at when we prescribe any anti-diabetic treatment, we should look at the uh, kidney because this, the drug may need modifications. And this two studies, these two studies show that there is therapeutic inertia. Therapeutic inertia means that the prescribers are not following exactly the guidelines for each drug. So it is better to educate the doctors towards the best use of the drugs. For example, in elderly, this uh, black uh, segment of the bar reflects the percentage of patients who received the drug inappropriately, uh, either prescribed in excessive way or contraindicated. This is regarding metformin. Regarding the German CKD cohort of patients, the anti-diabetic drugs are very variable. There is a big variability in prescription. However, insulin is prescribed to more than 50% of the patients. The, the, this is a very important question. Is there any dose modification adjustment recommended for the different forms of insulin? The answer, there is no specific uh, recommendations, but we give the uh, standard dose and then adjust the dose according to the patient response and development of hypoglycemia. This another smart uh, figure shows the different codes. The green colors means it is uh, beneficial. So if you look here, this is a pharmacodynamic. So metformin is associated with lower all cause mortality, cardiovascular events, risk of hypoglycemia, no weight gain, and it is effective. So if we can use it in chronic kidney disease, it, is, well, the, it will be the best to start with. And then, if you look at these drugs, the, although they are effective as evidenced by green color here in A1C, but they increase all cause mortality, cardiovascular events, risk of hypoglycemia, and would gain. So, so, when we decided to start treatment and GFR of the patient permits starting with metformin, start with metformin, and if the patient needs second drug, it's better to uh, look at all these pharmacodynamics adverse effects and to, to select the cheaper drug with minimal adverse events. When you decided to start metformin, we should instruct the patients to temporarily withdraw metformin in conditions of banding dehydration when undergoing contrast media investigation or when there is a risk for acute kidney injury or instability in stem in GFR. If you if we look for example to the difference between DBB4 inhibitors and sulfonylurea, this is one of the studies. If you look the uh, here the white color refers to cetagliptin DBB4 and the gray color refers to the sulfonylurea. So you can uh, see clearly that the use of sulfonylurea is associated with more hypoglycemia. And this is a very interesting figure. To the extent of weight gain by sulfonylurea, DB4 inhibitor is associated with weight loss. So again, this is an advantage for DB4 inhibitor over sulfonylurea. Regarding sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor side effects profile, this class of drugs may be associated with diabetic acidosis. And you can find the warning from the FDA about the occurrence of the diabetic ketoacidosis, that means state admission to intensive care, and also urinary tract infection and uh, sepsis from uh, UTI, a genital myocytic infection, increased LDL cholesterol, hypovolemia dehydration, hypoglycemia, electrolyte disturbance, uh, hypoglycemia if it's combined with sulfonylurea or insulin, bone fracture, which is questionable. And from this uh, study, that is meta-analysis for 38 eligible randomized control trial, 10 for CANA, 15 for DABA, and 13 for EMBA, you will find that the association of risk is not evident with this class of drugs. This is a case report shows that the use of sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor may be associated with hypercalcemia because of dehydration, 
and this is another uh, pharmacodynamic interaction here DB4 inhibitors and statin there in this case report the use of statin uh, uh, DB4 inhibitors cetagliptin plus statin atorvastatin was associated with development of rhabdomyolysis so if the patient uh, uh, is treated with that combination and complained of the myalgia or muscle pains we should be careful about this regarding nephroprotection here this is the situation of the nephron we have uh, hyperfiltration we have here uh, increased sodium glucose reabsorption in the type 2 diabetes and there is um, uh, increasing rust system so if we combine the treatment of sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor plus S inhibitor this will give the maximum protection from the nephrology side of point of view because the use of sodium glucose uh, co-transporter inhibitor plus S inhibitors will shift the renal angiotensin system toward angiotensin 1-7 which is a vasodilator and prevent the progression of chronic kidney disease and one of the important studies that was published in New England uh, early this year is IMBA uh, it was published in June the last month IMBA glyphosine and the progression of kidney disease in type 2 diabetes IMBA reg outcome trial this trial showed, uh, selected the patients with diabetes and smidge for above 30 milli per minute and they were randomized either to 10 or 25 milligram of IMBA and the results uh, were striking towards uh, decreased worsening of nephropathy with the use of this drug and the renal outcome uh, uh, parameters are better with the use of the sodium glucose transporter to inhibitor in comparison to the other arm. While the use of this class of drugs is associated with improvement of the cardio-renal functions because if this is uh, increasing uh, improvement in circulation, decreasing intravascular extracellular volume, so uh, decreasing systolic blood pressure, decreasing afterload, the myocardial oxygen supply improved. So because of all these variables, both the heart and the kidney uh, um, uh, are improved. And this is um, the thinking of the shift in the fuel energetic may explain the beneficial cardiorenal outcome because this drug leads to a decreasing fat oxidation, increasing glucose oxidation, increasing beta hydroxybutyrate oxidation, and increase the energy efficiency of energy by giving ATP for oxygen, and increasing cardiac efficiency, and increasing kidney efficiency as well. So at the end of the day, the use of this class may be associated with the cardiorenal benefit. Again, this one of the Kidney International papers sh discussing the issue of renal protection of sodium glucose to transport to inhibitors, maybe through glycosuria and aterosis, and this leads to uh, this uh, improvement in uh, the total body fat mass reduction uh, that is associated with decreased inflammation, decreased fibrosis, uh, decreasing uric acid, uh, and other important variables that end at, uh, in, the, in the path of cardiac and renal protection. This is one of the important study, studies because it uh, was conducted in rats with 5 6 in nephrectomy, non-diabetic rats, and shows that the use of linagliptin, which is DBB4 inhibitor, is associated with uh, equivalent uh, nephroprotection away from the diabetic control, and this is uh, through the inhibition of inflammatory cascade. Again, this is a very nice review. And if you look here, the use of DBB4 inhibitor is associated with lower incidence of uh, all these microalbuminuria, macroalbuminuria, and CKD worsening or loss of symmetry FR. So DBB4 inhibitor is associated with nephroprotection. And this is the tacrolimus induced uh, fibrosis, as you see. This is a vehicle, and this is tacrolimus. You find here fibrosis with the use of the drugs. Here you find that the use of the class of DV4 inhibitors ameliorate the fibrosis uh, as a complication of tacrolimus. So inhibition of dibeptidyl peptidase inhibitor uh, protects tacrolimus induced kidney injury.
Metformin is also associated with nephroprotection because metformin ameliorates hepatocyte damage by restoring renal tissue nephrine expression in type 2 diabetic rest. And more importantly, this is the large number of patients in a cohort and this is a comment about the lower risk of kidney cancer in patients treated with metformin in comparison to other drugs. As you see here, this is the number of patients, a very big number and the uh, ever use or never use are correlated together. So the use of metformin is associated with lower risk of renal cell carcinoma. One of the important points that we should exhaust ourselves in improving the patient adherence to receive medication. Because this study that included more than half a million persons showed that adherence to oral antihyperglycemic delay the, ins the instance of indices kidney disease. And non adherence of oral antihyperglycemic medication will increase the risk of indices and disease. Show. So we should educate patients and doctors toward the issue of non adherence. We should, the patient should be adherent to the treatment. Regarding metformin and lactic acidosis, if we look at the subclinical, we, find, we may find a relatively higher percentage, but uh, the clinical evidence of lactic acidosis is so rare, exceedingly rare. And this is the rationale beyond this uh, complication, accumulation of metformin, more inhibition of mitochondrial complex one activity, reduction in ATP production, and this leads to activation and simulation of glycolysis or fatty acid oxidation with accumulation of ketone and acidosis. So this is the rationale. We have two terminology, MILA or MALA. MALA means the lactic acidosis was low grade associated with the accumulation of metformin. But acute decompensation of acidosis is MILA, uh, metformin induced lactic acidosis. And if we have uh, poisoning from metformin, especially with severe lacti lactic acidosis, with serum lactate exceeding 20, this is an indication for dialysis for these patients. And we shouldn't stop dialysis. We repeat the dialysis sessions until serum lactate decreases significantly and the patient situation improves. You can fix this slide to see the physical, chem uh, chemical, and toxicokinetic data of metformin, the general. Um, indication for extra corporeal treatment, as you see, this treatment is recommended in severe metformin poisoning. This is recommendation based on very weak evidence. A start dialysis if uh, lactate above 20 millimol per liter, a standard therapy, supportive measures, and bicarbonate fail. And the suggested if lactate is between 15 to 20. Cessation of the session if lactate decreases to less than th 3 millimole per liter, and we can choose, uh, we can select the treatment dialysis according to the availability. Uh, we can use intermittent hemodialysis with bicarbonate buffer. This is a preferred, but CRRT, slow continuous therapy, is an acceptable alternative if hemodialysis is not available. To conclude this presentation, I'll Put this question again, is an oral drug superior to another? The answer is, there is no clear evidence for superiority of any drug over the other to treat diabetic state in patients with chronic kidney disease. So from the guidelines, the thinking is, if we can use metformin, start with metformin modified according to the kidney function. And then, if the glycemia state is not, per, is not controlled, we can add either the DVB4 inhibitors with modified dose, or we can use sulfonylurea with inactive metabolites because of the cost analysis. Again, we should think of avoiding hypoglycemia rather than hyperglycemia, because hypoglycemia is fatal in uh, some cases. So this is the rationale of management of these patients. What do we need? We need a lot of research. If you look here, this is for the Cochrane database, the insulin and glucose lowering agents for treating people with diabetes and the chronic disease this is a protocol. So still there is a gap in knowledge. And this is one of the articles that showed 
discussed new treatment for diabetic kidney disease. And I think we need personalized medicine for diabetes, especially for diabetic kidney disease. So we should individualize the treatment according to the patient's characteristics and according to the kidney function. And we should look at the interactions because the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic interactions are so crucial in these patients. And this is one of the uh, news from Health Today reported that people who bike to work or regularly cycle for fun appear to have a decreased likelihood for developing type 2 diabetes. So this, this is one of the, my perspectives is to encourage the healthy lifestyle for, for all because if we succeed to prevent the development of type 2 diabetes, is, it is very safe and better than to wait until diabetes needs treatment. Again, and this is the last slide, and this is the uh, quotation of Voltaire, who stated that doctors are men and women who prescribe medicines, of which they know little for diseases about which they understand even less for people about whom they know nothing. So our role should be, we should know our patient, we should know the diseases, and we should know the drugs that we prescribe to avoid the mishaps and atrogenic complications. And thank you for your attention.